Hi, so some weeks ago I came across this clip where Bosch speaks about the labor theory of value with a man that goes by the name of antidepressants here in YouTube and I strongly disagree with a lot of the things that were said there. Now I spoke to Bosch uh, through email and we actually spoke about having a conversation probably in August on economic issues and probably on the labor theory of value. So what I want to do today is basically comment on what was said in this video and uh, say basically what my position is so that uh, if Bosch watches this and if anyone that is interested in this conversation watches this, uh, you can all know uh, what exactly is my take on what Bosch had to say about the labor theory of value and where the points of disagreements on this issue are. And although I'm going to be critical of some of the things that Bosch has said here, uh, this is really not a recriminatory uh, video that I'm going to make because him and I share political goals in common and I think that, you know, uh, not everyone has to be an expert on every single issue. He knows a lot about the issues where he has studied more and I certainly respect that of him, but I don't think that he has enough knowledge on economic issues such as this one. So I think that uh, we could both uh, make use of a conversation where uh, we discuss these issues. So um, this is really not going to be, you know, a destructive criticism, but rather this is going to be, you know, an opening up of a discussion where hopefully uh, he can learn uh, things about the empirical evidence surrounding this issue and about the formalities of the labor theory of value that can help him in his own understanding of social issues, of economic issues, so that whenever somebody like antidepressants comes and presents arguments that are pretty nonsensical, uh, he can actually make a, a good defense of uh, Marx's positions such as this one. So when they begin to speak about this issue, Bosch first gives a short explanation of what this theory says. So let's listen to this first. Um, I think that labor theory of value is just an interesting framework through which to uh, analyze the relationship between labor and capital. I don't think that it's like a scientific theory. I cringe when socialists use terms like the immortal, sci liber the, the emancipatory science of Marxism, Leninism, any mm. nonsense like that. Um, I'm a sociologist. When I look at ways to describe the world, I see events and I see theories and you try to apply them as best fit um, as much as possible to try and gain an understanding of the world. Uh, LTV is useful for reframing our understanding of the relationship between the worker and the laborer. But I don't think it's like an economic law that needs to be respected, extigent, any broader social forces. Already in the way in which he frames this conversation, uh, we have certain problems to take into consideration. First of all, he claims that this is not a scientific theory. And this, of course, depends on how you define a scientific theory because there are different branches of science there is the natural sciences there are the social sciences and there are the formal sciences and the labor theory of value is clearly not a scientific theory in the sense of belonging to the category of natural sciences but it is a scientific theory as it belongs to the social sciences it is a theory that tries to explain something about political economy and what exactly does it try to explain well, it tries to explain, it tries to explain relative prices in capitalist societies where commodity exchange is generalized. And this being the purpose of the labor theory of value, we can already see that it tries to explain something in the world and it actually makes predictions, uh, one of which we're going to look in here to see whether or not it is actually empirically accurate. And it is actually falsifiable because Bosch, as he discusses this, he seems to move more towards a position that the labor theory of value is really an unfalsifiable, abstract, philosophical theory, which actually is not true. It is a scientific theory. It is a theory that tries to explain something about political economy. And as we're going to see, it actually is empirically sound. You're, hand you're handicapping yourself, you're kneecapping yourself, and I don't know why you're doing it, other than the fact that there's some reverence to Marx for some reason. Well, wait, well Marx didn't... Ref Marx didn't refer to his own theory of value as the labor theory of value. The labor theory right. of value existed he, before. He, he, appropri no, no, he appropriated it from Smith and Ricardo. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, but but 
I don't know what you mean by debunked. It's a philosophical argument, not a not a economic one. Um, like for like the the juxtaposition is this fundamentally the 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 traditional way of assessing the value of a commodity in a market economy is um, how much will a person pay for it? What is it worth? framed through its price point. You know, you meet your supply demand curve, great. And a lot of people will make philosophical prescriptive judgments on that, you know? Um, like for example, if you produce, a, as an artist, I can attest to this, if you produce, produce a piece of art, let's say a video game or like a little short film, I don't know, something, and people don't buy it, some people would argue, well, hey, nobody liked it, like this hasn't done well, it must not be yes. worth that much. Whereas, in labor theory of value, you know, it's more of an argument that no, the worth of an of anything of a service commodity is more a product of that which was put into it, the labor of the worker. But this is this is philosophy, not uh, not like hardline economics. You couldn't debunk this any more than you could debunk like a stoicism. You can make arguments against it, certainly, but I think it's valuable because when I look at things through a labor perspective, like labor theory of value perspective, I gain a, a a different vantage point from which I can assess what things probably should be valued at. Um, but it's just an argument. I don't think it's like a mathematical formula or anything like that. If people right. are using it that way, I don't... It has nothing to do with price, after all. It's just a, a you know, it's just a, an, an argument to value. So in line with what we have heard before, Bosch here claims that this is actually a philosophical theory. And this is untrue, as we've seen. The labor theory of value tries to explain relative prices, and it actually tries to explain them by... Uh, looking at the labor that is embodied in the commodities that have these prices, that have exchange value. Now, this is something that I think that Bosch doesn't really understand here, which is the difference, uh, well, the definition basically of value. Now, in Marx, value is abstract, social, and necessary labor time. And this being value, what he now does is say, well, this is actually going to say a lot about the way in which commodities exchange against one another in the market and as we're going to see he's going to build the prices of production based on this labor and these are going to be basically the fundamental prices so these are going to be uh, in the same way that the fundamental value of a stock in financial theory is the total sum of dividends discounted at the interest rate in the labor theory of value, we say that the fundamental value of a commodity is this price of production, which is the center of gravity of the actual market price. So it's not going to be necessarily equal, but it's going to be the regulator of market prices. And this is actually testable and we're going to see empirically accurate. So he then says in demonstrating that he doesn't actually understand what value is, and that uh, he doesn't really understand the relationship, the quantitative relationship between exchange value and value, he's going to say that um, he's going to give us this example of a painter that produces a painting or a piece of art and no one wants to buy it because no one finds any use in it. But he claims that the labor theory of value says that even though no one wants it, that there's still the case to be made that there is some value in it because of the labor that went into its production. And this is far from the truth. So Marx makes it very clear in the first page of Das Kapital, in the in first chapter and in the first page, that commodities are useful objects. And thus, because they are useful objects, people want to purchase them. If someone doesn't want to purchase an object, that object cannot be a commodity because a commodity is a use value that has an exchange value. If if an object is not a use value, no one wants to buy it, it cannot have exchange value and it's therefore not a commodity. So no matter how much labor you input into a painting, if no one wants to purchase it, it's not going to have any value, it's not going to have any exchange value, it's not going to be a commodity. So to claim that the labor theory of value is trying to explain even when people don't want to purchase something, uh, the value, I don't even know what he refers to there when he speaks of value, of that particular object, this is actually false. Then he claims that this theory actually cannot be falsified, that it cannot be debunked 
uh, in the same way that stoicism cannot be debunked. And this is, again, untrue. First of all, because it's not a philosophical theory. Uh, second of all, because uh, it is actually falsifiable, as we've seen. So if you're trying to explain market prices and you're trying to link these market prices to an, an aspect of the commodity, which is their value, the amount of labor that they that goes into their production, then you can actually test this and you can see whether or not actual market prices are regulated by prices of production. So again, this is absolutely false. Then he claims something about the theory, trying to say something about how commodities should be valued. And there are no odd statements in the labor theory of value. It is a purely descriptive theory. So this is again false. And to end, he claims that there is no mathematical formula to uh, describe this theory, to actually try to uh, formalize what the theory says. It's just an argument. I don't think it's like a mathematical formula or anything like that. And this is actually false. As you have in the screen right now, the theory actually has a mathematical formalization to it. And what you have in the screen is the equation for relative prices of production or relative natural prices. Now, the theory says that if you take the price of some industry here denoted as industry X and you divide it by the price in another industry, that being here industry Y, these relative prices are basically going to be explained. And these are prices of production, not necessarily market prices, but the centers of gravity of the market prices. Now, these are basically going to be explained by the relative labor times. So the, the abstract socially necessary direct and indirect labor time that went into the production of the average commodity in industry X over that same amount of labor time that went into the production of the average commodity in industry Y and a disturbance factor, which are the profit wage ratios. Now, this is basically going to be a very small disturbance factor, as David Ricardo already pointed out. Now, I'm not going to get too deep into the derivation of this particular formula. I, I will leave that for future videos. But what I will say here is that this disturbance factor, as I've said, accounts for a very small deviation between relative prices and relative labor times. So what basically determines the natural level of these prices, of relative prices, is Ricardo would say it's labor time, direct and indirect labor time, and, and Marx would add to it that it is not just concrete labor time, but it, that it is abstract, socially necessary, direct and indirect labor time that counts in that equation. So basically, prices of production are going to be mainly determined by labor times, and these prices of production are what regulate market prices. So the prediction that is drawn from this uh, theory is that if we look at the data and we see market prices for a set of industries, we see the relative prices, we construct these prices of production, we will see that there is a very small deviation between the relative labor times and relative prices of production and between the prices of production and market prices. So does the theory actually predict something that exists in the world? Is it actually empirically accurate? Well, in this paper, which is one of the economic studies done on the empirical strength of the labor theory of value, economist Tan Walshaik tries to see whether or not this first hypothesis that we have outlined here is actually empirically correct in the United States for the years that you have in this table. Now, here you can see the mean absolute weighted deviation, which is a measure of deviation uh, between two particular values uh, for uh, three categories. So first you see the deviation between labor values and market price. And you see that the average deviation taken into consideration all this year is actually of 0 0.092, basically of 9%, which is a very small percentage deviation between labor values and actual market prices. This is actually as we've said, a prediction of the labor theory of value, that through time, this is going to be a very small difference. And it is actually empirically correct. It is also predicted that there is going to be a very small average deviation between prices of production and market prices. And you can see here in this average that it's about 8%, which is also empirically accurate. 
And we also predict a very small percentage, percentage deviation that Ricardo already points at this very small percentage deviation between labor values and price of production, which here you can see that it's about 4%. So taking into consideration this data, we can in fact say that the labor theory of value is empirically accurate because one of the predictions that it makes, now there's more predictions, I'm not going to go uh, too much in depth into each one of them, but this is a fundamental prediction of the labor theory of value, already known since the time of Ricardo, and it is actually empirically correct. So we can in fact say that the labor theory of value is an economic theory that is actually testable, that is actually empirically sound, and it is not just some abstract philosophical argument that tries to explain something about the way in which we should value commodities. Now, as far as the claims that antidepressants makes regarding this issue, uh, he really doesn't have a strong position at all. He constantly conflates use value with value. He doesn't accurately represent what the labor theory of value tries to explain. He doesn't know what value really is for Marx. And thus, since he doesn't understand at all this theory, he makes very weird claims. One of the things that he says is that the paradox of value is actually something that disproves the labor theory of value. He claims that it was Karl Menger, uh, the first one to talk about this paradox. This is not true. Uh, Adam Smith already talked about this paradox and he actually concluded based on this paradox that the labor theory of value is correct because it takes more time to produce a diamond than it takes to produce a glass of water. So we cannot actually uh, say that this is somehow a theoretical difficulty for the labor theory of value because it isn't. In fact, it is the reason why in the classical tradition they rejected theories based on subjective value. Now, in the marginalized revolution, they brought about um, a sort of ad hoc explanation for this paradox based on marginal utility. But, you know, um, you know, if, if antidepressants wants to debate this with me, I will gladly debate the labor theory of value or subjective value theory with him. Now, he must understand, and this is something that I don't think he knows, that neoclassical price theory is different from the value theory of the Austrian economists. And this is something that he doesn't also represent quite accurately. So it's not all, so it's not the labor theory of value versus subjective value theory and subjective value theory is exactly what every economist after the labor theory of value agrees on because there is differences between the neoclassical conception of value which they don't actually have a conception of value per se they present us this demand and supply corps which austrians actually deny they are also against the framework of equilibrium between supply and demand corps and in the Austrian tradition, they do have a purely subjective theory, which I've argued that is completely flawed and that it's actually more close to astrology than the labor theory of value could ever be. So if he wants to debate this with me, I will gladly do it. But for now, my focus was on looking at what Bosch had to say so that if he watches this video and if anyone that is interested watches this video, uh, they can know what my position really is and where I actually come from.